The scripture reading for today is Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, found on page 919 in the Pew Bible. If you do not have a Bible of your own, you are welcome to take one with you. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. This is the word of the Lord. Please remain standing. Let us pray. Now, Father, we've come once again. We've come to your word expectingly, looking for it to shape how we view this life and looking for your word to inform our actions our decisions, and our values. We're looking in your word this morning for hope and the assurance of things, things more valuable than the, than the things that are passing away in this life. So we ask as your beloved children, beloved not because of anything in us, but because of what Christ has done to us and for us, we ask, we ask you, Father, to bless us. We ask you to give what only you can. Guide us, teach us, convict us of our sin, and drive us to the cross. We pray that your spirit renews our minds, transforms our hearts, and brings about fruit. Fruit that is pleasing in your sight. A transformed life. We ask these things confidently this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Listen to these words. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have learned about him, and were taught in him, as all the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Much of what we've been seeing In chapter 5, as we've spent the last month here, is the application of this dichotomy between putting off the old man and being renewed in our minds by the Word of God and by the working of His Spirit, putting on the new man, putting on the new self. So, for example, Paul says at the end of chapter 4, put off all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander. Put it off and put on kindness towards one another, 
a tender heartedness towards one another. Put on a, uh, a mentality that is eager to forgive. Be an imitator of God. Put off sexual immorality, purity, and covetousness. Put off foolish talk, crude joking, and filthy language. Put on thanksgiving. Uh, put off uh, those things that people do in secret, those things for which the wrath of God is currently being poured out. Put off partnering with the unbelieving world. Put on loyalty to Christ. Put on consistency in your life. Put on discernment. Put off foolishness. Put off a lack of wisdom and knowledge. Put on wisdom. Put off intoxication, drunkenness, which is debauchery. Put on being filled with the Spirit. Now, in our passage, uh, we come to the put-offs and put-ons of husbands and wives. And uh, later we'll be looking at uh, children and parents and uh, slaves and masters, or we might say for our context, employees and employers. The dynamic is the same. Uh, Paul will implicitly be telling wives this morning to put off rebelliousness and individuality and to put on godly submission. Next week, brothers, uh, Paul will be telling us to put off selfishness and juvenile self-centered living and put on sacrificial love. It's the same dynamic. And so let's read this passage as we go through the rest of uh, chapter 5 into chapter 6. Uh, remember what Paul is doing here. He's sketching out the Christian life in light of what Christ has achieved. Those chapters 1 through 3. And now he's showing us what not to do, what to put off, what to do, what to put on. Now, before we go to our passage, which begins in verse 22 of chapter 5, uh, let me mention a few things. I realize that in this room there are a number of you who are not married, uh, both young and old, and for whatever reason you're not married. Um, you may be thinking, okay, the next weeks we're looking at marriage and family. This week it's wives. It's providential given it's Mother's Day. Next week we're looking at husbands. As you know, brothers, the Lord has much more to say to you in your role of, uh, as a husband than he does to say to wives this morning. Ironically, the sermons probably won't be any shorter, but uh, he has more to say to you. And then... Thereafter, we'll be looking at what the Lord has to say to parents and children. You might be tempted, if you're not married, to zone out here and say, okay, this isn't really applicable to me. Oh, but it is. If you're not married, my general counsel to you is to get married. And to do so young. Marriage, you recall, is the first and most critical institution established by God in this creation. It is the one institution that makes civilization possible. Indeed, it is the institution which brings about civilization. It is also the institution which can save civilization. George Scipione, the late Reformed theologian, died relatively not too long ago. He said this, the family, beginning with the marriage, is the church in embryo. That is God, when he began to create, he instituted marriage. He didn't begin with the church. He didn't begin with the state. No, he created a microcosm of his own inner life. A marriage. 
that marriage would produce children and it would train those children to be good church members, good citizens of the state. It would imbue in those children sacrificial living and altruism and moral righteousness. Family is critical and thus the normal normative position that we should have is an emphasis on people getting married. Not an emphasis on people remaining single. The Bible tells us that marriage is a good gift from God and the highest gift that is given a man apart from redemption in Christ is the gift of children, which the Bible calls a treasure, a heritage, a reward, a recompense given to his people, and that can only come out of a marriage, or at least it should. So if you're here this morning, get married. And incidentally, if you're wondering, well, where will I find this spouse? You're in the right place. There are plenty of people here from which to pick. There's only one other place on the earth that you might be in a better position to find a spouse, especially if you're young, and that is Bible college. That's why we call it bridal college. But this is the place, a place of like-minded people, a place where people love the Lord their God. Two exceptions to what I've just said. Among the people in this room who are not married, there are a few of you who have been given by the sovereign grace of God the gift of singleness. This is a, a true spiritual gift that has been uh, given to you whereby God has removed the desire for you to be married and He has placed in your heart a desire to devote all of your time to His service. If that's you this morning... I want to tell you on behalf of this congregation, we love you, we need you, and we're glad you're here. And we're amazed that God's given you that gift. And we marvel at the power of that gift. But that is an exceptional gift. Remember that family brings about civilization. If everyone had that gift civilization would collapse. Exceptional, not normal. It is great. It is praiseworthy. It is amazing, but it is not normal. There are those of you who are here who have been married, but are no longer. And whether that is through being widowed or perhaps being divorced, I think it's a it's an open question as to whether or not you should be married. It may be that you should. It also may be that you shouldn't. For those who have gone through divorce, do you know that the Bible forbids remarriage under certain circumstances? If that divorce was not brought about because uh, of infidelity or abandonment, you are not permitted to get remarried. That is, unless that spouse passes from this life to the next. It's a complex question. But for the rest of you, pursue marriage. That is the common grace of God. And do so young. For many of us, we've been tempted to buy into a view of relationships that has more to do with modern pagan spirituality than it does with biblical Christianity. And think about the way the Bible begins. God creates man, puts him in the garden. Everything is good except one thing, man's alone. Why? Man's made in the image and likeness of God. God is not a loner. God is social. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, always in loving relationship and so he creates a helper suitable for man the bible says 
mention, leave his mother and father, cleave to his wife, the two become one flesh. God oversees the first marriage, and in fact, Jesus teaches us that God establishes every marriage. And so marriage is a good thing. It's also a means of saving our civilization. I hope you're paying attention because what we're seeing is the beginning of our civilization collapsing. Do you know that? What we're seeing is the beginning of the failure of our nation, of American culture, and of our civilization. It is collapsing. Why is it collapsing? Because families are faulting. Because marriages are ending. Because we have sought to redefine and edit and change what is uneditable. When families collapse, nations collapse. When marriages fall apart, civilizations crumble. And you know what God's solution to all of that is? You want to hear the inspired an errant plan to save civilization? Get married young. Young. The Bible doesn't say a man should leave his father and mother, go off for four years, accrue an ungodly amount of debt as if the borrower isn't slave to the lender, and then go and live the next 10 to 20 years doing God knows what, and then after you spent the best years of your life doing something other than being married, settle down, cleave to your wife, and the two will become one flesh. Is that what we're taught in Scripture? Why does Proverbs 5 tell men to enjoy and rejoice in the wife of their youth? Because the expectation of the Bible is that you would get married young. For two reasons. Number one, because marriage is a means of God sanctifying and changing you. Secondly, it's a means of bringing children into the world. God's plan for saving civilization is that you would get married young, that you would work hard and with excellence in your profession, that you would love the church, and that you would have and raise as many godly children as the Lord your God would give. You do that, you bring the will of God to bear upon the earth as it is in heaven. You expand the kingdom of God incrementally. That's how we change this. That's the biggest tool we have. And so I hope you'll think about that. And so in light of that, let, let us look at our passage. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Paul now giving us the inspired instructions for the function of the home. He says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands when Paul, and indeed all of Scripture, envisions marriage, it envisions a covenantal union with one woman who is to be a wife and one man who is to be a husband. That's what marriage is. It is defined not by man. It was not established by man. Rather, it is defined and established by God himself. God in the garden, after placing Adam in the midst of the creatures, giving him dominion over the earth, making him his vice regent to rule the earth and to mirror his godly leadership, Adam finds no helper suitable among the creatures of the planet, and so God puts a deep sleep on Adam and takes something from his side. The translations say rib. It's, the Hebrew is much too ambiguous for rib. It's something from his side. 
something close to his heart, you might say. And he takes that from Adam, and out of that thing that Adam no longer has, he makes another. A woman. And so now the man has precisely what the woman doesn't have. And the woman has precisely what the man does not have. And when they come together, there is perfect complementarity, and they together as one flesh mirror the image of the living God. One man, one woman, in covenant for life. We cannot change that. We cannot edit that. Regardless of what some politician or the machinations of some court may say, that is what marriage is. That is what it always has been. And no one can change it. The modern zeitgeist of gay marriage is, it's not marriage, it's a mirage. It is nonsense. Think about what gay marriage is. It is not complementarity. It is not diversity in a relationship where you have one who has what the other does not have. No, it is man seeking to lust after a mere image of himself. That is idolatry. And this, a so-called marriage that is rooted in sodomy, it is an abomination. We cannot capitulate. We will not capitulate. It is absolutely wrong, and it is not marriage, regardless what the laws of the state of Connecticut may say about that. That is why, as evangelicals, no matter what the pressures are, uh, you know, in society, no matter what, you know, Christian celebrity capitulates, we will not budge. Why? Because this is how God created humanity. More than that, we're told, and we will see later on in, uh, in this study of Hebrew, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, that marriage is a type, a foreshadowing of the relationship between Christ and his church. If you changed the meaning of marriage, if you redefine it, what you have done is implicitly redefine the gospel of Jesus Christ. We cannot change the gospel. We cannot change marriage. So Paul says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. In this verse, in the underlying Greek, there is no verb. It just says, wives, to your own husbands as to the Lord. The verb is implied from the following verse, which is, uh, in verse 21, he says, uh, submitting one to one another out of reverence for Christ. And this is very common in Greek to do this, to, to borrow an antecedent verb. It's, it, we, it happens in English from time to time, but uh, that is what Paul has done here. And so to get the gist, we must go back a, just a little bit to verse 21. And Pastor Mike did a wonderful job explaining this last week. He says, uh, that as Paul says, we are to submit to one another out of Reverence, the term there is phobos, fear of Christ. Reverential fear, godly fear of Christ. That is the overarching tenor of the Christian life is to be one of submission to one another. That implies submission to authorities, certainly, but it implies submission to one another because each of us is in Christ. And so Christians should be, of course, respectful to authority. That is, if the police officer pulls you over, even if you're on your way to church, you should address him respectfully. And if he tells you to do something that is within the bounds of our Constitution and state law, you should do it and do it right away without hesitation. If the magistrate commands you to do something that is right and good and legal, you should do it because 
submitting yourself to authority is commanded of you. If your brother confronts you over your sin, submit to him and repent and be reconciled to God. We should not be a rebellious people looking to usurp authority wherever we find it. That is not who we are. That may be the ethos of certain quarters of our civilization today, but that is not who the church has ever been. We're not anarchists. We're people of order. And we must thus, out of fear of Christ, submit to one another. Let me ask you, do you fear Christ? Do you fear him? People will often redefine that word fear to mean make it mean something something other than fear. No, fear means to have fear of him. Are you fearful of him? When you think about him, do you want to straighten up? That's the kind of fear I'm talking about. I uh, teach at, just part-time at a Christian school in town here, and I went into my classroom, somebody had written on the whiteboard, uh, what if you could spend, you know, lunch with Jesus today? What would you do? And I thought, there's only one suitable answer to that question. I would fall at his feet as though dead. Isn't that what happens to John? When John, who spent three years with Jesus, sees the glorious resurrected son in Revelation. Isn't that what happens? He falls on his face because the weight of Christ's glory is crushing him. It is right and good to fear the risen Christ. Not fear him because of an impending punishment but fear him because he is a consuming, glorious, thrice holy fire. And so, Paul, borrowing the verb from verse 21, says, Wives, that is by way of example of submitting to one another, wives submit to your own husbands. Now, as Pastor Mike noted, just because Paul says submit to one another, it does not negate the fact that, there are, there are particular situations where submission and authority are implied. And if you say that, then you run afoul of what Paul says regarding children and parents, or children not to submit to parental authority. Just because Paul says elsewhere, submit to one another. No, that's obviously not what he's suggesting. And so we have particular relationships now that we're looking at, the first of which is wives and husbands. And so the question we want to ask is, what does it mean to submit, for a wife to submit to a husband? Well, look at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, if you would look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to be picking it up here at verse 2. Paul writes, Now I commend you because you remember me in everything, maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Very similar to what Paul says in Ephesians, is it not? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Here, Christ is the head of man. The head of a wife is her husband. The head of Christ is God. Therefore, Paul says, wives, submit to your husbands. And I realize that that word submit for many people is incendiary. 
is even hated and despised. I read a number of commentaries, not in the evangelical traditions, which just explicitly call Paul a misogynist, suggest he's peddling outdated and backward uh, Jewish principles. Is that really what he's doing? He's a misogynist? I don't think so. I think they're assuming something that Paul hasn't intended. Look particularly in 1 Corinthians 11, at verse 3, where Paul says, The head of Christ is God. The Greek word head is kephale. Kephale means authority over. Although there are some that would argue that it means source. That's a, a relatively new argument designed primarily to free wives from having to submit to their husbands. It's promulgated mainly in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. People have made much of this argument, writing tomes, arguing for the meaning of kephale to be source. The reason why those arguments fail is because while the term meant source, it meant source hundreds of years before Paul wrote this. And at the time when Paul wrote this, the term had sort of come to mean authority over. And so in order to make that argument, you have to appeal to anachronistic literature so it doesn't work out. Wayne Grudem, uh, a New Testament scholar uh, and a systematic theologian, wrote an article where he surveyed over, uh, it was around 3,000 uses of the term kephale, and not one of them meant source. All within the relevant time period of the New Testament. So the term means authority over. Which means, when Paul says, the head of Christ is God, God is in authority over Christ. That's what Paul is saying. Now here's the thing. The Son of God is co-equal and consubstantial with the Father, meaning that He shares the Father's divine being. Or in the words of Hebrews, He is the exactness of the Father's nature. He possesses all of the attributes of the Father. He possesses all the powers that the Father has. He is just as eternal as the Father. He is transcendent like the Father. He is omniscient like the Father. So much so that when Philip in John chapter 14 says, Jesus, show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. Jesus says, Philip, have I not been so long with you? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because he is exactly like his Father. He is the image of the invisible God. That's why John calls him the Word, because he is the one who reveals God. And so Christ is equal with God. He shares his divine being. The only way the Father and Son are differentiated is the way that they relate to one another and the way that they relate to the creation. But there isn't an essential difference between them. Or what philosophers would call an ontological difference, a difference in being. It's not there. They're distinct persons, eternally so, but they share the same divinity. The Father has eternally begotten His Son. His Son is of Himself. And so if the Father and Son are co-equal, and they are, then what does Paul mean by saying Christ, the head of Christ, is God? He's not talking about what Christ is or what God is. He's talking about how they function. He's not talking here in categories of worth, value, dignity, and so forth. He's describing functional differences, the way that they relate to one another. And how does the son relate to his father? The father establishes his will 
and the son joyfully and eagerly obeys him. In every case, the son submits to the father's will. Because he's inferior? No, he's co-equal. Because he's less than the father? No, he is precisely like his father. No, there's a functional difference. That's both true after Jesus is conceived in Mary's womb, and it's true before Jesus is conceived in Mary's womb. It's true before even creation was made. The Son had always submitted to the Father's will. Not out of some kind of begrudging obligation, but because that's what he desired to do. When God made a covenant with his Son in eternity past, before creation was made, the Father determined that he would save his elect, and the Son submitted himself to that desire. And agreed to become our savior and our substitute. So, the implication here is massive, and I hope you get a hold of this. In as much as we recognize that it is godly to lead well, what Paul is arguing here is that it is just as godly to submit well. It is godly to lead well. Why? Because you're mirroring the leadership of God the Father in whatever context. It is godly to lead well in the church because you're mirroring the characters, uh, the characterization, the uh, the attributes of God the Father. It's godly for husbands to lead well because they are in fact mirroring the Father. But it's godly to submit well. Because in so doing, you portray Christ on the earth. That is why Paul says at the beginning of this chapter, be imitate, imitators of me just as I am of Christ. Or perhaps a better translation, imitate me in so far as I imitate Christ. Going back to what Paul says, therefore, in Ephesians. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. What does as to the Lord mean? As you would submit to your Lord, submit to your husbands. How do you submit to your Lord? You revere him. You would never say a dishonorable thing about him. And while things may be difficult, you obey him. Wives, submit to your husbands like that. And you might say, well, you don't know my husband. He makes bad decisions all the time. If I did that, I would be out on the street. There are qualifications. There are exceptions. If your husband tells you to do something illegal, don't submit to him. If your husband seeks to persuade you to do something that is ungodly, do not listen to him. But other than that, Paul does not provide us a conditional kind of submission. He simply says, wives, submit to your own husband as you would the Lord. But let me ask you, if you knew that your husband was a godly man who was steeped in the riches of God's word, who was filled with the spirit of grace, if you knew that your husband was loyal to Christ above all else, and when he made decisions, he was going to do so to honor you. If you knew that, that was the husband that you're submitting to, it would probably be a lot easier, I'm guessing. You'd probably, be, you'd probably run into submitting to that. Who could complain? 
And so what I have found in my own marriage and in counseling others and helping them with their marriages is that when a wife is reticent to submit, it is usually because their husband has played the buffoon and the juvenile and the coward for a long, long time. It's because he hasn't led well in the limited opportunities that he's had because he squandered those opportunities on selfishness and short-sighted living that his wife now struggles to submit to his authority. But had he been leading sacrificially, graciously, lovingly, had he been cherishing her just as Christ cherished the church, she would likely be not be seeking a way out of submission. But that is not to say that wives shouldn't submit to their husbands if they don't, in fact, think they are qualified to lead them. Paul makes no such exception. He simply says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. In other words, submit to your husband, believer or not, Submit to your husband whether he, you perceive him to be a wise man or not. Submit to your husband whether you think he has your best in mind. Submit to your husband whether you think his decisions are foolish or not. Again, with the aforementioned limitations of don't submit to him when he calls you to sin. But the general overarching tenor of your life in your marriage, ladies, should be submission to your husbands. Let's think about what that looks like. I haven't defined submission. And I bet there's a lot of things you're picturing right now of what that looks like, right? Let's fill in the void and see. What is, what does it mean for a wife to submit to her husband? Let me give you a couple of things that it doesn't mean. Submission to one's husband is not passivity. It is not becoming a Stepford wife. It is not rubber stamping every whim of your husband. Becoming a yes woman. If you think that's what submission is, brothers, you are sorely, sinfully mistaken. Submission is not blind obedience to your husband. He is not God. Submission is not following your husband into sin or condoning his sin. Or enabling his sin. Submission is not inferiority any more than Christ is inferior to the Father. And so what then is submission? It is following your husband's lead. It's encouraging him to take initiative. Think about the created order. So many of these issues are so well put in the beginning chapters of Genesis, aren't they? God creates man to tend the garden, to rule over the earth. That's his mission. He creates woman for the distinct and express purpose of helping the man. She is his suitable helper, his complement. The term helper is not derogatory. Dozens of times God is said to be our helper. Is he less than? When the psalmist declares the Lord is my helper, is he saying that God is inferior to him? When God is described as an ever-present help? Is 
the Psalter saying that God is less than? No. That's not a derogatory term. Rather, the term helper simply is a kind of functioning, a descriptor that tells us that a wife's responsibility is to help her husband. Submission is synonymous in this context with helping one's husband. Helping him to do what? Helping him to honor and glorify God. That's the point. That is the point of wives submitting to their husbands. To establish in their husband patterns of God-glorifying thought and behavior. The chief example of that, of course, is Christ. He is the one who models submission. Christ is the ultimate Example of godly submission. And so when you ever, whenever you have a question as to what submission should look like, it should look like the way Christ lived. Submission is encouraging your husband's initiative. Submission is giving your husband wise, godly counsel, seasoned heavily with the word of God. It is arguing with him in order to persuade him. I'm not talking about fighting. It is giving rational argumentation for a decision rooted in the truths of God's word over and against something else. It is counseling him in a way that will bring about a better outcome. Brothers, husbands, I believe apart from the spirit of grace, the greatest counselor you have is your wife. And you are a fool if you don't listen to your wife's counsel. If you think your wife's counsel is unhelpful, unnecessary, you are a fool. You need your wife's counsel. You need it. You need it because she is your helper, given to you by God. You can't accomplish the mission on your own. You need help. And she is that help. Godly submission is to demonstrate your trust in your husband. What often distinguishes men who follow through with what they're seeking to do, whether in career or something else, the thing that distinguishes those men apart from the working of God in their lives is a woman who has put her trust in that man. It is a woman who has affirmed that man in his decisions. Not in a, again, a sort of passive rubber stamping way but in a way that is respectful and rigorous in its counsel and debate so that the right decision becomes clear and is discerned well and she puts his her trust in him because she knows he'll make the right decision That's why Paul so, can so confidently say, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Because what he has in mind is often what, not what we have in mind when we think of submission. A rather, submission, again, is following your husband's lead. It's encouraging his initiative. It's engaging him in counsel. And it's putting trust in him to do the right things. That's what Paul has in mind. And so he says in verse 24, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. 
no limitations. How does the church submit to Christ? Well, I would hope that we would submit to him in everything, in every detail, in every aspect of what we do. And it would be a reproach upon us if we didn't submit to him in everything, wouldn't it? And so wives, submit to your husbands in everything. There are examples in the Bible of this. There are good examples. There are bad examples. There are some people who present to us both sides of that equation. Uh, Sarah, Sarai, uh, is a good example. On the one hand, uh, she is an example of uh, not much of a submissive wife, especially as we think about the Hagar affair early on in in Abraham's uh, ministry, where she sort of nags and... uh, and gives terrible counsel to Abraham. Abraham capitulates to that bad counsel to engage in relations with Hagar, a decision that has terrible implications for the lives of that family and for Israel in the future. But then we see later on that Hagar embodies a wonderful and rich submission, and she is held up in the New Testament by the Apostle Peter as someone who honored her husband by even calling him Hakirios, Lord. Brothers, don't let that go to your head. The point here is that she, in so honoring her husband, was seeking to honor her Savior. Don't think for a moment that there's something so honorable in you Brothers, that your wife should call you Lord. The point is, she's seeking to honor her husband in everything as the church submits to Christ. Or in her case, as God's covenant people submit to Yahweh and honor him. There are many examples of this in the Bible. Many examples of wonderful powerful and submissive wives. We think of Abigail, for example, her former husband Nabal, and then her later dealings with David. And I would encourage you to seek out those examples. But again, the most critical example of the authority submission dynamic is God himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and then additionally in, uh, in God the Father. But wives are nonetheless called to submit in everything. I recognize that uh, for those of us who live uh, with a, an unbelieving husband, this raises all sorts of questions. To what end can I submit to a a man who does not share my, my most treasured beliefs? Who is not even operating out of the same worldview, the same ultimate commitments? How can I possibly submit to him in everything? You can. And the way that you do that is you circumscribe your submission, you limit it in those areas where to submit to your husband would, in fact, be to submit to sin. Where, in fact, it would curtail your Christian spirituality. That is where the limit lies. And so if your husband tells you you're not to go to church, that is when you say, judge for yourself whether it is right for me to obey you or the living God. At that point, his authority has ended, and he is on his own. But in other matters, matters of not such high or moral or theological importance, you should submit to your unbelieving husband and honor him. Never say a dishonorable thing about him to anyone. 
Don't be the kind of wife who says negative things about your husband in public or among friends. Don't ever speak poorly about your husband to other people. Husbands, this goes for you. Don't you dare denigrate, criticize, or complain about your wife to anyone. That is the woman that God has given you. And in the same way that Christ does not gripe about us, despite the fact there being plenty of things for him to gripe about, husbands should dare not do that to their wives. How could we denigrate our Savior? We couldn't, and therefore wives ought not to do the same thing. Rather, we should seek to honor Christ in all things, and so, as wives, submit well in everything, and husbands, to lead well in everything. But in the case of an unbelieving husband, I recognize the difficulties, and I trust that the Spirit of God will give you timely words when the time is right, that will give you the wisdom that you need to navigate those issues. But you should know that your godly submission to your unbelieving husband, the Bible tells us, may win him over, meaning may convert him without so much as a word. God has given you a mission field right in your own bed. And there's a reason why God has given that unbelieving man a believing wife. And if we were to take God at his word, I think we should be expectant that God will one day use you to win him over without even a word. And so for those of you in an unequally yoked situation, let me encourage you to persevere. Let me encourage you by saying that while many of us don't know what that's like, we can imagine the great difficulty and heartache that is brought about in a situation like that. Invite us to pray for you. To pray for your husband's salvation. But the most strategic means of saving that man is you. God has put a spirit-filled Christian right next to him in lifelong marital union. And so let's leverage that to the glory of God. Let us pray.